To me, social justice is a simple concept. It's the notion that all people in a society deserve fair and equitable rights, opportunities, and access to resources. Huh. You call that social justice, but you know that there is a better word for what you are talking about. Egalitarianism. Because social justice seems to care more about classifying people as either oppressed or privileged and then pitting them against each other by imposing divisions of blame and self-hatred. But it's become controversial and nebulous because we've stopped talking about what working for social justice actually looks like. It has become nebulous. It is not inherently nebulous. All right, I am ready to be educated. What does social justice actually look like. Working for social justice can look like this. The civil rights movement. Well, egalitarianism also looks like that. But do go on. Or this. Volunteering at a soup kitchen is an act of social justice, not merely an act of goodwill or an act fulfilling court-mandated community service. Got it. It can look like this. Registering to vote is an exercise in social justice. It is not an exercise in representative democracy. Got it. Or it can look like this. That is an exercise in social justice. So that was not a glorified tantrum by an average football player to get a better contract deal. A tantrum that was transmogrified into an act of social protest when the optics of acting like a spoiled child became a PR liability? Got it. Or my favorite, it can look like that. Those are my students. And whenever I'm asked to articulate my work or my priorities as a teacher, I explain that I believe education can be a tool for social justice. Education can be a tool for social justice. Education is a means by which to guide young people into a specific ideology. Got it. But a few months ago, I logged on to Twitter, as I do, and I saw that a fellow teacher had taken issue with that belief. Teachers, he said, should not be social justice warriors because the purpose of education is to educate. And he, he ended his argument by saying, I teach my subject. Well, that sounds like a very rational and pragmatic person. Educating children on the facts of your field of expertise and allowing them to make up their own minds. Not using your position to proselytize on what you may or may not believe to be socially or morally correct. I assume that this reasonable perspective was a problem for our speaker? But I reject that simplification, because teachers don't just teach subjects, we teach people. Oh, clever, clever wordplay there. Twisting someone's words into something they didn't actually say, and then condemning it from your self-conjured perch of moral superiority. Is that the type of skills children can hope to learn from social justice? When our students walk into our classrooms, they bring their identities with them. Everything they experience in our rooms is bound up in historical context. Everything is. Why? Exactly who is bringing in the historical context to the classroom? The young, impressionable student who has been alive for less than 20 years? Or the adult teacher who is obsessed with imparting social justice. And so if we insist that education happens in a vacuum, we do our students a disservice. 
we teach them that education doesn't really matter because it's not relevant to what's happening all around them. And what's happening all around them? Well, racism, for one. Racism is happening all around them. Well, I wonder if our speaker can put what is happening today in the historical context of, say, 60 years ago? And then I wonder if she could define the concept of proportionality for me. In 2016, the University of Chicago released a report that revealed that according to results of the implicit association test, fully 88% of white people harbored subconscious biases against black people, believing them to be less intelligent, lazier, and more dangerous than whites. And that's just one concrete example of the insidious effects of historic and systemic racism on our country. The implicit association test is a racism test? Gosh, it feels like I have discussed that claim before. Regardless, was it that 88% of white participants were shown to be racist against black people? Or was it that 88% of white people were shown to have a bias in favor of white people just like 48% of the black participants also had a bias in favor of white people. And would it also surprise our speaker to know, quote, that doesn't mean all respondents who show implicit bias engage in actual discrimination. Indeed, it doesn't even mean that all respondents who show implicit bias actually harbor bias. They may simply be reflecting cultural knowledge of stereotypes or mere familiarity. So, is the mischaracterization of test data and the omission of related relevant statistics also a part of an education in social justice? For more evidence, we could look at incarceration rates. We could look at statistics on police violence against black people. We could look at the opportunity gap in education. So, yeah, social justice belongs in our schools. Yes, we could look at all of those things, but our speaker will not. She will just toss buzzwords out into the ether and hope that any gaps in evidence for systemic racism will be filled with faith in systemic racism. Social justice should be a part of the mission of every school and every teacher in America if we want liberty and justice for all to be more than a slogan. I wonder if our speaker has any notion of just how sinister this is beginning to sound. Because schools are crucial places for children to become active citizens and to learn the skills and the tools that they need to change the world. Yes, young minds are indeed malleable. This is why they should be treated with care and not seen as the target of an ideological mission. So what are those skills? Okay, here's a secret. Many of the skills that people need to orchestrate the kinds of change that will lead to justice are already built into the work of schools. Things like problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, perseverance, none of that should be revolutionary on its own. Combine that with the ability to understand history, not as one static and objective narrative on which we all agree, but as a series of intertwined events about which there can be countless interpretations. History cannot be an objective truth. History can be interpreted in countless ways and is intertwined. Are we on our way to intersectionality by any chance? If we deliberately choose to explore history with our students rather than just teach it, we help them understand that history is ongoing and that it's connected to current movements for justice. And we help them see themselves as potential players within a living history. Our speaker is honestly sounding more and more like a zealot as we proceed. But maybe the reason that my Twitter critic wasn't happy with that idea is because he doesn't agree with my definition of justice. Fair enough. Maybe he and I don't see eye to eye politically. But here's the thing. 
Our aim is to encourage students to articulate their own opinions, not to coerce them into agreeing with us. So it actually doesn't matter if he and I agree. What matters is that we're helping students have those conversations with each other. So if you have a student that, for example, actually looks at what the implicit association test actually says and questions your conclusion that 88% of white people are racist, the precepts of social justice will not take that student to task for wrong think? Well, if you say so. And that means that as adults, we need to learn how to become effective facilitators of our students' activism. We've got to help them learn how to have really tricky conversations. We have to expose them to different opinions. And we have to, have to help them see how what they're learning in school connects to the world outside. That is some excellent sophistry. Though I wonder if any of the opinions our speaker would expose her students to, or give equal time for, would inherently contradict her personal ideology. A few years ago, my principal got an anonymous email from one of our students. It informed him that the following day, the students planned to walk out of school. This was in the wake of Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, Missouri, and the students were planning to join a walkout and march in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. And of course, you took that opportunity to teach your students about the risks of taking public action in the absence of all of the facts. And you also advised them on the historical pitfalls of racial identity movements. Right? Right. So at this point, the staff at the school had a decision to make. Would we use our authority and our power to try to control the students and prevent them from leaving? Or would we support them as they put into practice the principles of social justice that we had taught them about since their ninth grade year? Oh, well, don't keep us in suspense, because I cannot even imagine what your faculty chose to do. So the next morning, the kids left school en masse and they gathered on the lawn. And one of the seniors jumped up on a picnic table and went over safety expectations. <laughs> and the younger kids took it very seriously. And as teachers and as staff, we told them, okay, be safe, and we watched as they marched off. You let a large group of minors march off into a Black Lives Matter protest unsupervised. Got it. The kids who chose to stay spent that afternoon in class. They debated the merits of protest. They talked about the history of the Black Lives Matter movement, and they went on with classes as scheduled. And those who chose to leave participated in a citywide student walkout and raised their collective voice for justice. And laid down in the street, protesting in favor of someone who had committed a strong arm robbery, assaulted a police officer, and attempted to take that officer's gun. And all of this was done in the name of justice. Got it. But no matter where they chose to spend the afternoon, our kids learned valuable lessons that day. They learned that the adults in their lives would support them, even as we worried for their safety. And they learned that they didn't need us to tell them how or when or even why to protest. They learned that they were members of a community of young people with a shared vision of a more equitable society. And they learned that they had power within that society. Okay, a bit of an aside here. But I do wonder whether the parents of these students understand that their kids are being instructed by an openly activist educator. That someone employed by a public school is guiding minds into a social justice interpretation of the world. Our speaker says she's teaching her kids to make up their own minds. If so, why is she arguing for social justice in education? And that's what education as a tool for social justice can look like. And here's the thing, our kids are ready for this kind of work. Ah, the work. It feels like I've talked about that before as well. 
So in 2015, incoming college freshmen were surveyed, and 8.5% of them said that they there was a very good chance they would participate in a protest sometime during their college career. And that might not seem very impressive, but consider the fact that it's the largest number of students to say that since 1967. Well, you're right. Less than 10% isn't that impressive a number. But as well, we have no idea what those students might be protesting in favor of. They could very well be protesting against social justice. And 75% of those kids said that helping other people who were having difficulty was a very important or essential goal for them. Again, the highest number of people to say that since the late 1960s. So most people think that helping others is a good thing. Yes. I am sure that that sentiment is only a very recent development. But wait a second. Is our speaker going to take the relatively common inclination of goodwill towards others as evidence of the efficacy of social justice? And research shows us that Working for justice doesn't just follow from building all those skills I talked about earlier, it actually goes the other way too. So working for justice, engaging in activism, helps students build skills like leadership and critical thinking, and it correlates positively with their political participation and their civic engagement and their commitment to their communities later in life. So in other words, students are telling us that social justice matters to them. Well, do they have a choice but to say otherwise? I mean, if they're having it taught to them in grade school as the ideal and just way of looking at the world, what other option do they have without painting themselves as an agent of injustice? When our kids threatened to walk out, a lot of the adults in our community were really conflicted too. Some of us worried that they might encounter violence, other people worried that they would walk out, but they wouldn't really know why they were protesting. And some, including some students' families, were really angry that the school hadn't done more to prevent them from leaving. Well, given that when a parent leaves their minor child in your care at school, I can understand why they might be angry that you let them loose out into what might have turned into a riot without their informed consent. But that's social justice for you, I guess. Better to rely on the wisdom of children rather than be a responsible adult. And all of those fears that adults have about getting this stuff wrong, all of those fears make total sense. But... But despite those fears, we've got to prove to our students that we will listen to their voices and that they do have the power to affect change. And what if their voices are wrong? What if their voices are uninformed? What if their voices are inconsequential next to the fact that their parents and guardians have the right to know what you are or are not doing with their kids? And I am dying to know what actual change the student walkout brought about. It's our responsibility to equip our students with the tools and the skills that they need to insist on a more equitable world. And then sometimes to get out of their way and let them apply those skills to things that they care about. You are their grade school teacher. You are not their parent. You are employed to teach young children the basics of education. Reading, writing, history, math, etc. You're supposed to provide them with the basic tools they will need to operate as they advance in their education. But instead, you're sounding more like you want to turn the kids into tools. Tools to build what you see as a just and equitable society. And that is not education. That is indoctrination. And living up to that vision is going to require that we are flexible, 
and it's going to require that we're creative. It's going to require that we're brave enough to stand up in the face of people who try to silence or delegitimize dissenting voices. Well, I guess it depends on whether those voices are legitimate in the first place. Tell me again about what the implicit association test data actually says. And hardest of all, it's going to require accepting the fact that sometimes we will be the ones our students will rebel against. Sometimes they're going to point out ways in which systems that we have created or in which we are complicit contribute to inequity. It's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be painful as they push us to question our own assumptions and beliefs. But what if we change the way we think about rebellion in our kids? Rebellion. Yes. Tell us all how we should think differently about rebellion. When our kids rebel, when they thoughtfully push back against our ideas or the way that we do things, what if we chose to see that as a sign that we're doing something right and that they're becoming liberated? I know it would be easier if their critical thinking skills manifested in more convenient ways. On their essays or their standardized tests, I get it, but convenience and justice do not often go hand in hand. And when our kids learn to think critically about the world around them, they become the kinds of engaged citizens who will recognize and question injustice when they see it and work to do something about it. So if you have students telling you that you are wrong or that what you are saying is nonsense, you'll put that as a mark in the win column. <laughs> Duh. Winning. Golly. Thinking that way almost means never having to be incorrect about anything. I really have to wonder if our speaker applies that same logic to criticism she receives from concerned parents. Welcoming rebellion into our schools is going to require some rethinking about what teaching and learning look like. Because there's this misconception that if we give students any wiggle room, they're going to walk all over us, and classrooms and dinner tables will devolve into total chaos. Well, I don't know. What have been the results of the last generation of kids having been more coddled than they were disciplined? Are the kinds of things we saw happen at Mizzou and Evergreen State, are those the kinds of behavior we should be encouraging? in young people? And if we expect kids to sit silently and passively receive knowledge from us, then their voices will always feel overwhelming. But if we accept instead that learning is sometimes messy, that it requires opportunities to brainstorm and mess up and try again, that our kids dislike chaos and want to learn when they come to school, then we can set up schools to facilitate that kind of learning. Yes, the kinds of schools that eschew chaos but take rebellion as a good sign. The kinds of schools that encourage debate but think that most white people are racist. The kinds of schools that want a variety of opinions while setting policy and curriculum around a specific ideology. Well, we have seen those schools. We have seen those kinds of teachers and administrators. We have seen the results of running a place of learning at the whim of the students rather than by the guidance of the educators. Ho, ho! These racist teachers have got to go! Hey, hey! Ho, ho! These racist teachers have got to go! But despite all of that, our speaker still thinks it's a good idea. In fact, given her rhetoric, she may even see Evergreen and Mizzou as success stories. And that's nothing to be afraid of, no. Because that is justice. As always, thank you for watching.